When I spin in this chair with these two masses out to my sides, as I pull the masses in, I speed up. And when I let the masses back out, I slow down again. Now this spinning in a chair question shows up in lots of different physics courses. And most versions of this problem boil down to one of two different questions. The first having to do with the conservation of angular momentum, and the second having to do with work and energy. And today, I'm gonna to walk you through everything you need to know to answer both of those questions. So let's start with the simplest and most common version of this problem. That is using angular momentum to calculate just how much a spinning person will speed up as they pull those masses inward. See, angular momentum can be calculated by multiplying angular velocity, that is, how fast something's spinning, by something called the rotational moment of inertia, that is a measurement of how hard it is to get some object spinning or to stop it from spinning. Or using variables, we use L is equal to omega times I, where L is the angular momentum, omega is the angular velocity, and I is the moment of inertia. And there's some units that I don't want to get too caught up in that go with each of those. Now this chair is rotating on bearings, so it has next to no friction. And if there's next to no friction, that means there's no torque. So why is that important? There's another way to quantify angular momentum. See, a change in angular momentum can be expressed as a net torque multiplied by time. See, the important part here is that in the absence of a torque, there is no change in angular momentum. See, at its heart, this spinning in a chair problem is really not all that different from a collision problem that you've probably already seen. When two blocks moving in a straight line collide, linear momentum is always conserved, and energy is either conserved, lost, or even gained depending on the type of collision. Well, this problem is basically the same thing, except in a circle. Now I understand, it's hard to view what's happening with these masses as a collision. As I pull them inward, I don't actually collide with them or crash into them. But mathematically, that's exactly what's happening. Meaning the initial angular momentum of everything rotating must equal the final angular momentum of everything that's rotating, even though I change where I'm holding the masses. Now at any point, the total inertia is given by the inertia of the person, that's me rotating on the stool, plus the inertia of the two masses. And this leaves us with that general equation that those of you who are stuck on your homework just searching through YouTube for answers are actually looking for. Now going back to me spinning in the chair, we know the value of each of the spinning masses, as well as their initial radius, which will allow us to calculate their initial inertia. And looking at the replay, we can measure the time for a single revolution, which allows us to calculate the initial angular velocity. And after pulling the masses inward to a smaller radius, we can measure the new time to rotate around once, which allows us to calculate the final angular velocity. But the big unknown here is the inertia of me spinning in the chair. So plugging those numbers into this general equation we came up with, we can solve for my inertia as I rotate on the stool. And we come up with my inertia as 5.74 kilogram meters squared. Now, frankly, every time I look at this problem, I'm a bit surprised. You see, these two dumbbells have a mass that is much, much less than the mass of my entire spinning body. But because they're rotating around at a much larger radius than I am, they have a relatively large rotational moment of inertia which means as I move these masses around, they have a huge effect on how fast my mass is actually spinning around. Now, no different from what we see in linear collisions, just because momentum is conserved, doesn't mean energy is conserved. Which brings us to the part of this problem that often gets brought up, but never really explained. And that is the change in energy of everything spinning as I pull these masses inward. Now, you're probably familiar with the equation that kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. But kinetic energy is also equal to 1 half i omega squared, where i is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular velocity. So now let's plug in our known values for both inertia and angular velocity to look at just how much the kinetic energy changes. See, plugging in the known inertia of both myself and the spinning masses, as well as the initial angular velocity, we find there's an initial kinetic energy of everything spinning on the stool of 99.9 .9 joules. Now, as I pull my arms in, my inertia really doesn't change, but the inertia of those spinning masses changes. And doing the calculation, we find in the end, there's 168 joules of kinetic energy. 
This means as I pulled my arms inward, the kinetic energy of everything rotating increased by 68.1 joules. So the kinetic energy increased, but unfortunately, that's where most people stop discussing this problem. But in order to truly understand what's happening in this problem, we need to answer the question, where did that energy come from? And the short answer is, that energy came from me pulling the masses inward. Now the proof behind this gets a little bit mathy, but let me show you. See, in order to keep the masses spinning in a circle, there needs to be a centripetal force on the spinning masses. And it's that centripetal force by me pulling inward that does the work on the masses. Typically, centripetal force is given by mv squared over r, but this problem is centered around angular velocity, so it's more useful to look at centripetal force as being equal to mr omega squared. Now the work done here is the result of the centripetal force acting over some inward distance, d, but there's an issue. The centripetal force is a function of the radius, so it's not constant as the masses are pulled inward, meaning we can't just simply multiply fc by the distance the masses are pulled inward. But turning the calculus, we can work through this problem. See, so looking at an infinitely small portion of the total work done, I'll call that dw, we can multiply our expression for centripetal force by dr, the infinitely small distance the mass will be pulled inward, leaving us with the work to pull the masses inward a tiny amount as their function of the radius. But we have to be careful here. This angular velocity is also a function of the spinning mass's radius. Going way back to the conservation of angular momentum, the initial value of i omega remained constant. So setting that equal to i omega at any other radius gets us an expression for angular velocity as a function of radius. Then knowing the total inertia is the sum of the person's inertia plus the inertia of the masses, we can substitute these functions into our work equation. Giving us this great big mess, but don't be scared. Everything in these brackets is just our expression for the centripetal force. But watch what happens when we put our experimental values into this work function. The only variable we have here is r. So everything cleans up pretty nicely, leaving us with a function for the tiny bit of work done at every point along which the masses are pulled. So to find the total work done, we'll take an infinite sum of all those tiny works, then we'll evaluate that integral from the initial position of the masses to the final position of the masses. So using a u substitution to solve the integral, then a fair amount of cleaning up the algebra, we find the work done by the centripetal force is 68 joules. And here's the big point, that 68 joules is the same 68 joules that we found was our change in kinetic energy just a little while ago. Meaning it was that inward pull on the masses that was responsible for the increase in kinetic energy of the entire rotating system. And this problem doesn't end just with a person spinning in a chair. If you look at the collapse of dying stars, or the rotation of the solar system, or even the revolution of Earth on its axis to form a day, the same physics applies. And so I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.